because it's really easy to figure out how to do it. You're not going to need me to show you today how to do these things necessarily. But we are going to go over it. Um, I do like to cover a lot of code. Um, I'm part of the meetup because I want to I want to do a lot of code with everyone. Um, so this is my second time presenting, and uh, it's going to be the same as the first time in a way. There's going to be a lot of code. It's going to be different, and that I'm not going to have two hours of content and try to fit it into one. Um, so we shouldn't have to hurry as much. Uh, my name is George Frick. Um, I've been a software developer for over eight years now. I currently work for Invisia. Um, we're like a partnership consulting firm. We kind of we we help with projects. Um, we don't necessarily um, just kind of come in and contract. We kind of partner with you and um, work with what you're doing and, and help with it. Um, bring in some expertise, mentor your team, um, so that when we leave, your team's in a better position than it was when we came. Um, I wanted to take a break, so I suggested I do a presentation on PhaserJS. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at video games and take a break from Enterprise. Um, so we have um, some goals. We're going to see a demo game. I had to make a demo game or it wouldn't be much of a presentation. Um, and then we're going to look at all the coding that went into that game. And then at the end of that, we'll look at what we didn't get to. So we have three goals when we're choosing a, a fun game framework to mess around with on the weekend, and we like JavaScript. So we want multi-platform, which we're in the browser, yay. Um, we'll see more about that. Um, it's really easy. We're going to see that like you're putting things on the screen in a couple lines of code. Um, and then it actually is pretty mature. People are working on this every day, day in and day out. Every day, some guy quits his job and makes video games for iPhones for a living. And this is one of those routes. So desktop, right? We have our browser. Um, we have Chromium, so you could make like a Chromium app out of it. Um, there's a way that way. Um, you could just have your app run in the mobile browser. Um, a good example of that is Firefox's example MMO. They have a little example MMO that's in 2D you can play. It's called like Browser Wars. It comes up right in the mobile browser or on the desktop. And then of course we all want to deploy to mobile if we're actually going to make a game. Um, which you can do. Um, Cocoon JS works. They're in the transition of being bought and upgraded. They had this really cool idea, and then Luday came in. And, um, it works. It's not the most fantastic. But if you know Android or iOS, they actually have the same class, basically. You have UI WebView or WebView, and you just drop it into the panel. We are not going to cover that, unfortunately. That would be you know, part two in order to cover deployment pipelines and all that. Um, easy coding. Um, library is free. You can read the source code. And uh, I actually think out of every library I have ever used, this is the one with the most examples. They actually have a complete example page, which we'll take a moment to look at later. Um, but like I said, that's why you, you don't need me. I'm just going to talk about how cool it is. And then whatever you want to build, their example page probably has an example of all the different parts. Um, but sure, they put a lot of work into support. They have a forum. They have IRC. They have a newsletter they send out with what they're working on. Usually what they're working on is compatibility with somebody's ideas. Oh, I wanted to work with Cocoon.js. So that's what they're working on this week. They're going to fix a bunch of issues with that. Um, you can tell this by going on there and, and looking at what they're working on. This is about a week old. Um, 2.2 came out in January, mostly bug fixes. And of course, you can see all that at docs.phaser.io. Um, for the rest of this talk, I will reference where I am in the doc. So if you're if you're on your laptop and you want to look up more about the methods that I'm talking about, you'll be able to go find that there. So our example game. I actually had originally set this up so that I would just click here and we would go to the game. But I actually want to show you how easy, I want to show some power of JavaScript. We previously talked about Grunt at JS Meetups. Uh, we've talked about the deployment pipeline a little bit. Um, so we're actually going to do that a little bit. So out here at GitHub, I have the example game. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy the URL. Hopefully the Wi-Fi here isn't horrible. There's Reveal.js running. So you could even do this right now. I'm going to clone this game from GitHub. Fun times. 
our normal NPM install, for those of you who aren't note aware, um, we'll have, like was mentioned previously, we'll probably have another note workshop. Um, if you like to play around with things, Node is probably the easiest way to get there. I don't know if that's suggested for um, enterprise level yet, but man, does it work. So. I'll listen to Enterprise. Right? <laughs> that's why, like, man, does it work? I haven't used it Enterprise yet, but it just works. We're seeing it here. Um, it kind of makes, it's like a, the new Maven. All right, so now I've done that, and now I'm just going to do Grunt. And if you, if you do pull this down, you're also going to see how much fun you can have in this because we're actually going to see that you're live editing now. If you make, if you go in and you edit the code to this game, it will live reload. But we're just going to play it because I just want to demo what I built first. So this is our basic shooter. Um, I don't know why it's muted. It pauses though, so I can figure that out for a moment. <laughs> um, the sound goes through the projectors, so it's not very loud. So we may not be hearing it, which it's kind of not fair because there's some really horrible sound in this game, <laughs> which I apparently cannot unpause now. That's great for a presentation, right? So the game is pretty simple. Your normal Space Invaders clone. Um, the sound was the joke part because it was like a shotgun sound. So you'll have to download it and, and run it. Um, and obviously it goes on forever, but they get more and more aggressive. They shoot at you more, and they approach you faster. Um, we'll see that. So but what we really have here is components of the games. We have our scrolling background. Um, we have our enemy sprites. We have our player sprite. We have all of our animations going on. Um, you know, We have our lives in the top right. So we're going to see how quickly we can put all these components on the screen um, without having to know a whole lot. Um, the way we used to. You know, in the old times, if you wanted to set this up, you would be writing your old image loaders. Um, you'd have to write a game loop, and you'd have to choose from the four or five different argumental ways to write a game loop. Do you do you time the? Do you do timing for rendering and timing for updating things, or do you just do one timer and update everything? And how do you get the FPS you want? We don't really worry about that here. We kind of let the engine handle it. Um, Instead, it's just an engine that's a lot of fun to make games with. Um, and then, if you really want to put it in, you can polish it and publish it. So let's look at some code. Actually, let's uh, oh, you guys can't see what I'm doing. Well now I'm firing up WebStorm, so that'll be good for later. Then we're ready. So how do we make that? Now we can start to go over all the different parts of the engine. Um, for those of us new to game development, all games come down to basically this. Um, the people who have done game development before will be like, that's the new approach. That's what we're going for. Um, you basically initialize your game, and then you basically have states. And then whatever your current state is, is you update that state, and then you render it. Um, you know, your AI makes its decisions update the positions of everything, render it. When you're done, you close the game. So game object. Um, Phaser.js is based on this core game object. You basically create a new copy of this object. And as soon as you do, your engine is started up. You can do whatever you want. Um, it gives you your common game elements. Um, it gives you your physics. It gives you your default state. You could do just one. We'll talk about that. And that's where you set up your width and height. And since we're in JavaScript, you can do all the things you would do with a web page. You can see if you're on a mobile device. You can see what the width and height is. You can see what the window view is. Um, everything, which means that you can adjust it on the fly for whatever's going on. So let's create a game object. Here's the simple way. You're just going to get an 800 by 600 game, which is what we did. And you're going to get nothing in it. And then here's like the super, actually, this is actually looks more complicated, it's actually the simpler way. Here's my game, and here's my preload function, my create function, my update function, and my render function. So you could make a little single page game, all the code in one file, and it's gonna just go. We're actually using the above one for our game because we're gonna do a couple different states. What are states? It's basically your state pattern. 
Um, basically, you're swapping out. So you have an update function. You have multiple objects with an update function. You're going to swap out which one you're calling update on. You're going to swap out which one you're rendering. And so for phaser, we're actually allowed to just give it as many states as we want, give them names, and then switch between them. And this is great because we can have a boot screen, uh, which normally we'd all know is a splash screen. You, you load the game, and the, the game's company logo comes up. Um, usually, they're secretly loading all their stuff in the background and getting the game going. Um, then you end up with the menu, and then you play the game. Um, some games do do pause as a state because you know you pause the game, you can do all the options and stuff. Um, we're, today, we're just going to do pause as you pause. Um, and then some games have a game over state. When I'm making games, I tend to just take you back to the menu because um, I don't have time. How do we add a state to phaser? Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with Lodash. I prefer to use underscore, but um, the phaser community prefers Lodash, and it is kind of winning the, the race. Um, so everyone's using Lodash. Um, so here we're going to do three states for our game. We're going to do a boot state, we're going to do a menu state, we're going to do a game state. For our boot states, that's usually where we do things like, what device am I on? Am I on an iPad? Then I want 1024 by 768 for an iPad 1. And we're going to set our resolution, and we might even load our resources based on that. In this case, um, we're, we're still just starting up our game. So we're going to add our states to it. We're going to create our game. And this game thing, by the way, is where it looks for on the HTML page to pop your game in. So it's going to look for this ID. Um, and then this is just an underscore loop to add all these states. I have this this way because I, like I said, if we stay, anyone who stays longer and I show them, I usually load all this from JSON. I'll have a JSON with a list of states in it. And I'll actually loop through so that I can swap those out without doing any programming. Today, we're going to kind of hard code everything. This is how easy it is to go into a state. We just start that state. What do states look like? Well, like all games in Phaser.js, they're basically just an object where you can provide it functions. It's kind of like an interface for our Java programmers. Um, for our JavaScript programmers, it's just like when you extend a class in Backbone. You just provide your overriding functionality. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, and you don't have to do any of them. You can do init, prep for preload. Um, you can do preload. This is what I usually load my assets. Um, create, which is going to get called every time you come into the state. Update is your core game loop. So for any of you who have written games before, you don't do your own game loop in Phaser. You don't have to create a timer. You don't have to do a set timeout. Um, there's no like infinite for loop that's waiting for the game over flag. You actually just have an update function on whatever your state is, and it's going to get called and pulled. And then Phaser is going to worry about keeping up with the FPS. Um, and then, of course, render doesn't actually render anything. That's just your, your bonus function where you can render things you want. What I will usually do there is I'll render debugging info. So if I'm working on like an RPG game, uh, like Zelda style, I'll use that render to render all the squares around sprites so I can see where the collision is going to happen. And that kind of gives me my debug mode. So that's state. <coughs> resources. So we talked about resources. And then when we played our game, we saw that there was an enemy ships. Um, there was our ship. There were lives. Um, when, when you hit a ship, it explodes. There's that explosion animation. Um, and then, unfortunately, there are those sounds that didn't load. Um, hopefully, they load for you. Um, so let's talk about how we load resources. It is, again, just as simple. Let's look at our actual boot states. Now we know what this boot state is. We know that the boot state is we create our game, we add our states, and we start this state, <coughs> which you can actually use for web apps, too, um, but that's a different discussion. Um, so for our preload function, we're going to use, we're going to see how simple it is in Phaser to bring in resources. And so here I'm bringing in my player ship. I just tell it where my image is, bring in my enemy ship, and then I actually can just tell it, hey, I also have a sprite sheet that's full of images. And then I can actually tell it those images are 84 by 84. So you can have a whole sprite sheet full of 12 by 12 Mario images. That's his whole animation of him jumping and his whole animation of him spitting fire. And you can load that all as one sheet. And it'll actually divide it up for you. And there are advanced. If you if you look at like if you look at the sprite sheet docs, you can actually give this JSON and tell it all about that sprite sheet. You can tell it where things are, what their names are, um, and that's what I'll usually do when I'm you know like if you're working on an RPG or something, or if you're working on a, a real 
space shooter where you're going to have multiple levels. You'll have all these different spreadsheets that you load based on the level. Um, loading audio is just as easy. Um, and audio actually works the same. You can just have one sound. You can make one WAV file and put all of your sounds in it. As long as you know where they all are in that file, that's all you have to load, which can save you some time. Um, our create function during our boot state would normally be where you would say, hey, I'm on an iPad, hey, I'm on a Galaxy S5 based on resolution or whatever, and you would set up your screen size here. I'm actually just going to tell the game, hey, I want it centered. That's the simplest we can basically do to show you. And, then, and so as soon as this is done, it's going to start the menu. This that game that start menu. So we've preloaded. These are all in the background loading right now. This gets called. We're going to start the menu. Um, there is some stuff kind of missing here. That's because normally you would wait. You'd say, hey, are my images done? Because I don't want to go to my menu if I can't render my menu yet. So one trick is to say, hey, are, are my sounds? And so this is my update function for my, my boot state. And I can say, hey, is my sound ready? Because PhaserJS actually has this cache where it puts everything. So you can even go check if you've loaded something. So when someone's loading a new stage, you can load only the resources you haven't loaded yet. Because you can always ask your cache what's sitting. You can dump things from the cache, and then you can reload them if you want. Um, so in this case, this is just an example. Hey, is my title music ready? Don't go to my menu till I can actually show it with the cool title music and all the cool graphics. Let's see if I can get my slide notes. So sprites. Um, those of you who've done game development, the sprites are sprites. Those of us who haven't, the sprites are basically everything on the screen. So the the player ship is a sprite. All the enemy ships are a sprite. Um, we can go up here for a moment. Oh, I closed my sprite. Um, everything you see on the screen is a sprite, especially if it moves around. Even that background, that scrolling background, is technically a sprite. It's just a huge sprite, and it's constantly scrolling its own image over itself. Um, so we'll look at how to add those, and we're going to see actually how quick it is. So for a simple sprite, and this is our actual code, if you actually pull down the game and look up the add player function, this is all it takes. Put my player ship at this location. I just hard coded it. Normally it's to be JSON data. And then I do this anchor. We'll look at what this anchor does in a moment. And this is how easy it is to turn on physics. Hey, this player has physics. I know you're all going to want to know about how to do physics. Um, so even though it's not in our demo game, we're actually going to cover it. Um, and then we just have our player. So now our player is on the screen. Rendered. It's using this player ship graphic that we loaded. Um, normally, that would be a sprite. And you would switch it, you know, like how, like if it's leaning left or right, kind of left all that out. But what about the enemies? First, let's cover anchor. So you saw that I set that anchor 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So basically, half and half. That's because I don't want to control my ship based on its top left corner, because that's kind of the default. Anyone who's worked with graphics knows whenever you're doing any type of rendering, you're usually starting at the top left. But I want to move my sprite around the screen based on its center. And so Phaser provides us with this anchor element that lets us say what part we're using or referring to when we're moving things around. It actually makes it a lot simpler, um, especially when you're doing collision and all that stuff later on. But a group of sprites. So in our game, our ship fires lasers. And so lasers actually lets us talk about groups in phaser. Groups are generic collections. We can use them for two things. We can use them to control whole groups of objects at the same time. In our example, we're using enemies, and we're, we're sliding them all right, we're sliding them all left. And that's not a for loop. We're actually just saying move the whole group. And in this case, we're actually going to use this to build a pool. Um, those of us who, you know, you might have, um, even for enterprise apps, you might um, keep a whole set of objects loaded on your server so that you can reuse them when you're answering requests. And this is kind of the same thing. We're going to use a group to create a pool because when that player fires that laser, we don't want to create a new laser and set its graphic and, and use those resources. So adding a group to phaser, this is just as easy as adding a sprite, game.add.group. So that, that add method or this add object on your game is a shortcut to a factory that will create whatever you're telling it to create. 
This enable body true and this physics body type, that's again, we're just we're turning on physics. And this enable body is saying, I want this to be able to hit other things that have physics turned on. Then we're going to call create multiple. And this is where we use this as a pool. I want you to create five. So, and then of course I passed in my image name. What you'll see is this is a shortcut so that I could create the enemy lasers and the player lasers in groups. Um, and so just like we created our player ship, whatever we call this with, we're going to get five of that image, which in this case is the laser image, that little laser that's firing. And so we're going to get a pool of five of them. We're going to anchor them off. We can actually call set all on our whole group now to, to change everything. Out of bounds kill, die when you leave the screen. Check world's bound, let me know when you hit the, the screen. Right, and so now I don't have to sit here and, and create 20 enemies and loop through them, setting all of these features on each enemy. I can create a group, put them in the group, and use the group to control them all at the same time. We'll see our anchor Y here is a little weird because we're basically using this to set the laser up above the player when it fires. So this is our one example of using set all. There are other ways to do things to the whole group. Um, if you look at the source code, you'll see some other way that I do that. I tried in the demo game to do things in multiple ways so you can see it. Now we saw that star background. That star background is actually two lines of code in the whole thing. So that's, <coughs> um, we created it at zero, 0, we create it with the size of our screen, and we tell it the image we want it to use. And then later on in our update function, all we do is we scroll it. Just move, 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 and move. We get that, group, that cool scrolling background. Last thing we'll talk about is how I did the animations for the sprites. Um, we saw earlier, we, this is what we saw earlier in our boot function, right? And then now for any, any sprite, I can say, hey, give me your animations, which is another factory function which you can use to, to do things. You can add, restart, play, whatever you need to do. And I'm actually going to add this explosion image as if it was an animation, because I already told Phaser it's multiple images. Phaser will do whatever I want with it. It'll either animate with it or it'll let me use it to show you know, varying states of an object. In this case, we're saying, hey, it's an, it's an animation. And then we can actually just play this animation. We can say how fast to play it. We can say whether or not to loop it. We can say whether or not to start it right away. Um, tons of options there, um, because a lot of times you don't want to just force an, you know, like if the explosion plays twice, you don't want to play it, wait for it to finish and play it again. If it's already playing, don't play it. Um, and so you have like your force restart, and there's all those Everything you would need if you were actually making a game. And then that's three lines of code to get an animated explosion. Um, this is kind of the advanced stuff. Um, I don't want to drag on about sprites, but since we've seen like 10 lines of code, and we've done almost everything we can do, we might as well see some of the advanced ways to do animations. And again, I would normally do this with JSON. I would have a big JSON mapping. And I would, I would map my player to its animations, and then I could just call things up. So we've added our character to our game, which is an example character. We're going to add a ton of animations. We're going to so um, this character would be like a sprite sheet. It would be like 20, and I'll show this at the end. Um, and then I'm just telling it which frames in that sprite sheet are the animations for this animation. So I can make a player walk right and animate it, have them walk up and animate it, have them walk down and animate it. And there's no walk left because that's the reverse of walking right. So I want to show the example of how you would kind of use that. And so here I'm, I'm switching on the direction the character is facing. If they're facing right, I set their scale. So you can scale anything in phaser. We're going to see that when we talk about physics. You can easily scale it. And I'm actually just kind of cheating here. And I'm just setting this to scale to 1 in case it was negative 1. Um, and then if my player is walking, I, I do their animation. So if the player's walking, I animate them right. If they're facing left, this is where the real cheat comes in. I just set my scale to negative 1. So it stays the same size, but it flips. And then I can just do my walk right animation, but he's actually animated walking left. So you get some really cool reuse. You get some of the features of like a, a more expensive game engine kind of built in. <sighs> Moving along. So here we have input. Um, this is another quick topic. They're all quick topics. It's actually kind of cool. Um, 
Binding and input is also a couple lines of code. I'm going to add the P button for pausing, and I'm going to add the M button for muting, and then you just add your events. So if you're making a non-game, this is also where um, you can do presentations with this or multimedia, and the input is actually really nice. And then, of course, on down will get called anytime, or pause will get called anytime you press P, mute will get called anytime you call M. But we can also pull any of us who have worked on games, even if you're new, you're going to have to pull the keyboard. Um, you don't necessarily want to do it on presses. You know, like players want to hold down the space bar. They don't want to you know, want to be jamming it, which is usually a game decision. Um, so in this case, we're going to create our fire button. We're going to say it's the space bar. All right, and now in our update, we can actually just say, is my fire button down? Can't get simpler. And then they actually provide us with a shortcut. Most games are going to use the arrow keys for something. So we can actually just say, hey, create those. And it creates all four arrow keys, up, down, left, right. So then we get this cursors.left, cursors.right. We can check all of them. We can see if they're down. We can see if they're up. Um, there's, there's a bunch of There's actually a lot of flags on there. Um, you can see, like, just pressed. It was pressed in the last millisecond or whatever. Um, and then you still can assign events to them. You can still say this.cursors.right.on down, call this. You can do both interchangeably. There are other inputs. I wish we had time for them, um, but I, you know, it's, it gets a little dry as it is, so I don't want to get into too many inputs right now. That's kind of part two if we want to do it. Um, but just as an example, you can do on tap, which is like a screen tap, and hey, start my game. So you can have that main menu. When you tap the tablet, the game starts. Um, the game actually supports drag and drop, or the, the engine actually supports drag and drop. You can take a sprite, and you can just say drag and drop equals true. You're able to drag that sprite around. You'll actually be able to do events on it, too. Um, it can do multi-touch. It actually does it by default. You have to turn it off if you don't want it and you want the performance. Um, and you just do, you literally do that by just setting the number of points you want it to accept. And it'll actually do that at <coughs> points, you know, depending on the hardware. Physics. So physics, we're going to get to see another demo um, so that we can stop being so dry. Um, but the physics is also the part where I was like, well, everyone's going to know about the physics, right? Like everyone knows what Box 2D is. Um, you can pay to plug Box 2D in if you're trying to make like a real commercial game. It's probably what you want to do. I use arcade physics. Um, it's not perfect. It's kind of like the just good enough physics engine. Um, you're barely on the edge of simulation, but you get some fun stuff. And then P2 and Ninja, um, if you read about those, they work a little differently. Ninja is more like gravity based. Um, we're just going to look at arcade physics. Well, we're going to look at how simple it is to use it. This is how you start the physics engine. Start up. I want arcade. So you could put Ninja here, you get Ninja. You can even switch it. Collision. Complicated. Overlap and collide. Overlap for when things run into each other. All right? So you have a player. And you want him to collect any items he runs into, you've got it. But you might want to have things collide. You might want to have them bounce off each other, asteroid style, angry bird style. But you also want to do a callback, like you want to change your animations so that your bird is surprised after <coughs> something. So you can actually call collide, and things will bounce off of each other with the physics engine. And even though I didn't show it here, this actually this actually supports all the rest of these calls. You can say this dot collect on collide. So that you can score when you hit something and still bounce off of it. You can do collisions any way you want. So we talked about adding groups to phaser. So I can actually say overlap a single sprite with a group. I can do a group to a group. And I can do a single up. That's supposed to be reversed. It's supposed to be lasered and player. Um, but I can do a group to a player. It doesn't care about the order you call it. You don't got to get it right. Um, and these are going to get called for every single thing that hits. And so you're going to end up down here where you're going to have on laser hit, and you're going to get the two things that hit each other, even if they are both from a group. And then here's what I was talking about earlier. You can do collide, let the physics engine do all its magic, and you're actually going to get a chance to do your work before that collision happens. You could change, you know, you could say, oh, I hit this, I don't move, and you could change the physics that it's heavy, um, all that fun stuff.
So an angry bird, how easy is it to make an angry bird? Well, we add our bird image, we put them on the screen, we turn physics on, we give that bird a velocity, send it flying. Tell it that we want it to hit the world. <clears throat> Tell it our elasticity, so you can set that to one, right, and it bounce forever. You set it to zero, and it's gonna hit the wall and go down. But we're also in the we're also in the fun physics engine, so it doesn't really behave that way. It behaves about approximately that way. And then we can actually set how how heavy we want gravity to be. Um, this is where I have one of my disappointments in the engine. I wish I could set this to 9.8 and get something a little more real. But if you set it to 9.8, everything basically floats. So you really got to start to bounce this number up, um, as we'll see. So that's that code live, bouncing our bird. We can actually bounce all the birds we want. We see that instead of bouncing off the pipe, he kind of slides. There's that friction. There's not enough to make him bounce. Um, you can kind of break the engine if you force it, but it's there. Like that's you know six lines of code it was. So very cool. Um, and we get our physics. I actually drop that pipe. The pipe hits the ground and stops. Um, kind of slides around. I don't know if any of you have heard of tweens. There's some popular tweening libraries out there. People are starting to do use tweens to make their websites pop. It's, it's the new way to add cool things to your website. Um, this game engine uses tweens. Um, if, you, if you want to know what a tween is, it's really easy. You just think of the, of the term in betweening. Um, you're basically having something figure out all the values in between. So if you want to move something from x equals 0 to x equals 100, you can tween it from x equals 0 to x equals 100. And the tween handles all of the increments. If you want to increment it in tens by tens, it will do the division and it'll do all the increments for you. So you're not doing an update loop and having to worry about all that. You're basically getting to send off this cool thread that'll go do it by itself. Um, we use this for behavior. We use it for animation. And sometimes physics isn't appropriate. In our last demo, I dropped that green pipe with the physics engine and there was no reason to do all that work. I could have just said, hey, move the pipe to the bottom of the screen. And then I wouldn't have had to worry about having to make the pipe not move after that, which was extra code. So let's see a tween. Well, a tween is simple. We add a tween to the game, we tell it what it's tweening, and then we can change any property we want. And you don't have to use this in Phaser. So if you don't even like making games, you got to learn something for your website design now. You can, you can bring the, the tweening engine into a website, you can tween things across the screen, you can tween, you can tween your fonts, Whatever you want to do. I'm going to tween the alpha of the sprite to one, which basically means I'm going to make it see through. I want to do it over a period of 2,000 milliseconds, so two seconds. <coughs> and this is how I want to do it. And there's a whole library of these. You can do a cubic and quartic and quantic and circular. And we'll look at, we're actually going to see an example of these different easings that you can do. I want it to start right away. Don't want it to delay. I want it to repeat. So my object's going to fade in and out. And then that's actually what this yo-yo does. So if I'm moving an object from x equals 0 to x equals 100, and I set it to yo-yo, I can actually use this to slide an object back and forth on the screen over a period of time. I don't have to do it in my update loop. I don't have to keep track of what's going on. I can just stop and start it. And we actually saw this in the demo game. All the, That whole alien group, one line of code, tween from left to right. And that's what it did. I didn't actually code moving them to the right, did they hit the right, move to the left, did they hit to the left. I just told it, hey, move from left to right, yo-yo, and repeat. And you can chain them. So I can do this tween, I can make my sprite invisible, and then move it, and then I could even now have it come back. So I gotta fade out, move, fade back in as an example. I can do multiple properties. I don't have to just move it to x equals 100. I can change any property I want over that process, and as many of them as I want. I can also do actions, so I can have callbacks. When it starts, do this, every loop. So every loop I can update, every repeat. Um, repeating and looping is different because the looping has to do with the yo-yoing, um, and the repeating has to do with you actually run it again. Now you can actually, you can do an on-complete, and it won't loop, it won't call it, 
if you're calling loops. So that's what you're going to want. You're on loop and you're on repeat. I've never used on repeat, so you'll have to read the docs and correct me on the exact difference. Easing types. We talked about this. There's all these you can do. It's fun. Um, you can do the linear one, which slides it. Um, well, let's just see. So I'm going to resize some pipes because we talked about how easy it was to scale. So let's scale these pipes and let's see how the different um, easings will scale the pipe for me. So at the, at the far left, we have the basic linear scaling. It's going to slowly scale it down, slowly scale it up. And then for some of these, we have some of the funky ones like this, uh, the circular and the quantic, which you can actually see you actually get a bigger pipe for a moment. It actually kind of pops out at you. And this wasn't any work. This is one line of code. You can do any one of these. You can do it moving across the screen. Um, it gives you all that power to kind of animate the game the way you want. So for a lot of us who, who never really had the time on the weekends to work with this type of, of animation, now we can just say, hey, tween it all out for me, and we're making games too. Um, actually, you like, fell in love with this part. Um, this is the best way I could show it, because uh, it shows the difference rather dramatically. Um, sound is easy. Sounds just as easy as everything else we looked at. So we're going to look at a couple single lines of code. I can load a sound, which you saw at the beginning. Um, I can add it to my game. I can play it. That's like your simple one, two, three. I can restart a sound, I can pause a sound, I can resume it, I can fade it in, I can fade it out. And then like I talked about at the beginning, you can add markers. You can put all of your sounds in one file and then have a JSON that's your mappings of your of your sounds, how long they are, where they start, and then you can just play each appropriate sound. You don't have to have a folder of 50 MP3s. And you can actually have Grunt compile them all for you too. So you could have different sounds that you can edit them and then have Grunt compile it. So let's talk a little bit about that advanced sound. We've loaded our we've loaded our sound. You'll see I loaded a bunch of different sounds. Any sound the browser can decode, phaser can play. So don't do OGGs on an old Android phone. Probably not going to get any sound. Um, that may explain my predicament because um, a lot of my sounds are OGGs um, or OGs. Uh, Barn Cow's not here to correct me. Um, Game that audio to add. I add my sound. I can actually add a marker to it. And what this marker says is at the five second mark. There's a six second sound called shot sound. Now I can just say, play just that six second marker. I actually have this here again. Everybody likes Webstorm, right? So in review, right? Scrolling stars. So we start our arcade. We create our stars. We add all of our sounds. Then we add our lasers. We add our enemy lasers. We add our player, our enemies, and our explosions. We're going to see these in a moment. I didn't talk about how to add text to a game. It's just as easy as everything else. You're calling add. You're telling it you want text. You can give it your font. It's it's you're you're creating a span or whatever it did on the screen anyway. So this is you're passing this style sheets. You can do whatever you want. Um, this gets called later. That gets called later. 
We create our cursors, our fire button, our pause button, and our mute button. I put this all in one file so it'll be simple. Anyone who wants to look through it can read through it. You can modify it. Here's our update function. This gets called by the engine for us. Every game tip, we don't know how long it's going to be. It's going to depend on the performance, the performance of the machine. Um, but that's why you can use a tween and have things happen over a period of time. Um, but I, I would not make like a, a, a network FPS with Phaser JS. Um, you might not get that update loop that you're hoping for. Um, we scroll our background. If our player is alive, Phaser actually provides us for every sprite a kind of set of basic game properties. Is the sprite alive? Is the sprite visible? Um, can the sprite move? Like, is its physics body pinned to the background? Uh, and then they're actually everything actually is in layers. I mean, you can have multiple layers, and then you might need to bring that sprite to the top or see what that sprite's Z value is. Um, we check our fire button and we fire <laughs> after moving our player. And then if we if it's been long enough, we have our enemies fire. And this is where we can kind of control that difficulty. Um, we call overlap lasers enemies right. Overlap, enemy lasers, player. Did the lasers, did our player's lasers hit the enemies, or did our enemy lasers hit the player? So if you play the game long enough, you'll notice that the player can't currently hit the enemies. Um, consider that an exercise. Phaser actually builds pause in for us. We can actually just put game.pause to true. The whole thing pauses. And then you actually have an on pause function that's getting called right now every loop. The game's pause, and you can do things in the background while it's paused. Provides a mute. We can actually set mute. Just tell the game sound engine that it's muted and it's mute, which makes adding a mute function in one line. Here's our group we saw, but I want to show a different group. Here I didn't I didn't lie about the player. There's the player. I actually added an extra line to the player to make him hit the world bounce. So that's all the code I needed so that he can't go off the screen. I actually just want to go to add enemies. So here's where we add a group. We turn on physics. We call reset enemies, which just runs a loop over all of our enemies. So this is like a boring way to do it, right? Call enemy that anchor, call enemy that move. But I'm kind of doing this because I want to be able to customize creation of my enemies based on difficulty or whatever. Um, but so it shows you that you can you, you can still loop over and do it any way you want. Uh, this remove all will literally dump all of those from the engine. Um, so every time we call this, we dump all of our enemies from the group, create new ones. And then we actually see, here's my tween. Take my enemies, move them to x equals 200. Here's my timeout, and it's linear. So if we go over, we'll actually see that it loops. And we actually see that I used an event. Every time you loop, descend. So every time it goes back and forth, come down. And that's all the work in this. That's all the work needed to make those enemies come down. Why not I get the back of you? Know? This is all code you can kind of review. It's kind of the standard. Um, I just wanted to show that like, you can call kill on a sprite. This isn't something I wrote. It's going to take it off the screen. It's going to basically blank it out for you. Now you can call revive, and it's actually going to kind of bring it back. It's going to put that image back on it, set it back to visible. There's all these, all these functions that are already there, and you can ignore them too. I have games I've worked on where like I don't want their kill function. I do my own. Why is it just the wrong resolution? Just. So we did not count event loops for timers. You can actually add event loops and timers and other things. You don't have to just tween things. You can say, I want to do all of this every X milliseconds. Um, it's pretty easy to debug. Um, you can actually set, you can tell it to do things like tell it where the camera is, and it'll render where the camera is on the screen. Um, for sprites, you can turn on like border rendering. Um, there's a lot of debugging built into it. We didn't get to touch um, touch input. We definitely didn't get to cut, touch JSON mapping. So if you're going to make a huge game, you're not going to be hard coding values. You're actually going to see how awesome it is just to map the whole thing out in JSON and then let the engine spin up, go through your JSON, create everything. And you even use it for your tweens. You use JSON all the tweens you create, and everything's there. Um, Phaser supports tiled files. Tiled is like a tiled map editor. So like if you're making an RPG or a Mario and you've got the little tile images, you just fire off tile, tell it what your image set is, and you can sit there and make your stages. You have a level editor. 
save it off as JSON, and then Phaser can load it, and it'll actually put your images right in, and you're in the stage, and you're ready to go. It's just a few lines of code. Um, and I wanted to cover Cocoon, but Cocoon is actually, um, you have to ship off your file to them. It goes into a build queue. They email you when you're out of the build queue and tell you where you can find your file. Um, and there's a few things in Phaser that cause it to break. So you'll just get a blank screen. Um, I'm not going to lie and say Cocoon's perfect. They're working on it. Um, but that's, you know, Cocoon works great for a web app. If you want to wrap a web app and deploy it, it works fantastic. To wrap something that's using WebGL is a little harder. Um, I should mention, we also didn't cover the fact that this is all um, WebGL falling back to Canvas, and you can force it to Canvas. You are getting that performance. So we learned how to load resources and create our game. We saw that you just add all the states you want. I want a play state. Um, I want a menu state. Um, I want a stage select state. So like if you're remaking Angry Birds or any of those modern games that are physics-based, they usually have that little screen where you select which level you want to play. You know, so you add a state for that, and then it launches you into the game state with the correct level loaded. Um, you just add your inputs, add your physics, add your sound. Um, and then whatever you want to do, there's probably an example or a demo. Examples.phaser.io hopefully loads. Everything I've showed you will look simplistic. You can do whatever you want here. Any anim if, you're, if you're like, oh, I want to I animate a group, but I want to do different animation for each thing in the group, there's an example. You know, I want to put a bunch of animations together and have them be structured, there's an example. Any arcade thing you want to do, there's an example. There's actually whole games in here. Um, I don't know if I already passed them. I think they're at the top. Anything you want to do at all. There's an example. It's a whole game. It loads in the browser. So you can go into Breakout. Like, oh, I want to make a Breakout clone where you can actually get started because it, it'll provide you one. And actually, Ajax loads these into this demo framework, um, which makes it a little hard for playing with them. Um, but you just copy it out to your own, and you're ready to go, assuming it loads. Did it really stop? In between? Well, that's loading. You can try to come back, unfortunately. Either way, I assure you those all do work, and there's like 105 of them or something. So they actually have a game started where they will walk you through creating your first game. We have the examples.phaser.io. We have docs.phaser.io. <coughs> You do, are you, okay, awesome. So the docs has this really great organization at the top. You can go and you can, you know, what can I do with the tile sprite? You have it all there right here. Not going to load up. Wait. So whenever you go to these examples, it loads the code in the bottom here for you. So you can see the whole code. Whole code. And then it usually loads whatever's going on up top. I'm, I'm assuming the server is pretty slow right now. Oh, there we go. <coughs> right, so you get this. This is actually one of the hilarious ones because it's this ridiculous picture of Einstein. Um, and you actually see how easy the code is down at the bottom right. They load an image, they add a sprite, <coughs> they create a tween, they tween it, and they start the tween. Right? Anything you want to do, you just go find the relevant example. Start from there. Um, this forum is actually like the Phaser.js forums. They're just—I don't know if they're hedging their bets. That it's not gonna 
that they might end up with something different. So it's just called HTML5 games. Uh, there's a lot of great blogs. Um, you can. This whole presentation is actually on GitHub. Um, so you can pull this down and grab these links out of there if you want them. There's this guy at Amazon who did a couple examples. Um, he did like a four or five part where he makes a little bit more complex game if you want to work through it. Um, most of them, you're going to make that stupid Flappy Bird. There's like 402,000 Flappy Bird <laughs> blogs, how to make Flappy Bird in Phaser.js. They all use the same pipe I used, but they all use that little Flappy Bird image. Um, the best one, um, if you're going to look at that, is there's a lot of them that do a performance example where like they load like a thousand Flappy Birds onto the screen, see which ones get through the pipe, the rest of them bounce off. Um, so there are some good ones you can find if you search that actually kind of teach you uh, and are cool, but be careful if you just Google phaser tutorial. Um, you got to dig a little bit. This guy at Les Milk, he actually listed them all out. And he doesn't include any of the Flappy Bird ones. Um, and then if you head over to Lude, you can play with Sakun JS. Um, the support is improving every day. Um, I'm really sad I didn't get the show tiled. I would have loved to show is like editing a stage and then bringing it in. But yeah, I actually managed to finish um, before the hour is up. Um, so thanks for listening to my talk. Um, that's my Twitter, um, gfrick at anvizia.com. And I can answer any questions. Are you going to mention this on, the, on JavaScript? Mm -hmm. Are you going to post some of the links on JavaScript? Yes, I'll actually tweet this Amazon one because it's probably your best one, or I'll tweet the um, I'll, I'll tweet the <coughs> started one. Um, but you can pull this down from my GitHub, and it has all the links in it. What's your um, GitHub username? I'll post uh, up George Frick. Okay. Sorry. I'll post up there now. <laughs> You gotta kind of dig through all of my boring projects, but there's these two are at the top if you come if you go in here. For any of us who are '90s kids, there's a, a mud editor you pull down, <laughs> written in Swing. If you're looking to have a really horrible Sunday morning, you play this in Swing. Yeah. So yeah, if you go into the intro, you can just look at the slides. I'll add it to this README too. I'll add the links here tonight. All the sources in here for that. If you come into this demo game, the coolest thing about this demo game is you can live code right away. So if you've never done live reload with JavaScript, even if you don't like making games, this is a great way for you to go check out my grunt file that I have running in there. You can you can bring up your your the project in WebStorm. You can sit and play with the game, change the parameters, change the images, and they're, the screen is going to reload for you. Um, so you got dual monitors, it's code here, watch the game pop up here. Um, great times. Questions? Hey, I got one. Who did you build your presentation with? Uh, Reveal.js. Okay. It's a little hard to be used to because you're editing HTML and you want that structure of PowerPoint. But once you're used to it, it's like, oh, now it's HTML. I can do whatever I want. I can, you know, I started off with no demos, and then I, by the end, I was like, oh, I can add, you know, I can add the physics demonstrations right in as a slide, which wasn't straightforward, but you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> he has all kinds of cool stuff in there. He has like a remote presentation mode where people can bring it up on their own device and you can change what slide they're looking at. Um, that takes an extra setup. Reveal is free. Yes. They do have a paid version and where you can put their source on their stuff. But you've done a lot of What does Cocoon do for you? So what Cocoon does is it provides a iOS and Android launcher. So it'll wrap the whole thing up into a, like an APK for Android and then you can actually send the game off. It also wraps it in an optional library, so they have like a um, in-game purchasing. Uh, they have a bunch of other things like that that they actually will wrap in there for you, or they, they inject it, and then you can you know make JavaScript calls to use it. So right, so right now that works better with just not not so like graphically intense apps. Correct. Like if you force it to Canvas, it usually works just fine. 
But if you need WebGL, there's a little bit of work there to make a clean happy. You might still be better off just firing up the clips, bringing up the Android editor, and adding a web UI. And then, you know, fire up your Objective C editor and add a web UI and manage your pipelines yourself. But if you get it working, then you get to only code everything once. You get to do in game billing once. Um, but they're still pretty early on. Like you, you can't even become like a premium member yet. They have all the stuff set up, and then when you say, like, all right, I'm ready to pay you money for this to really work, and then you go to it, and they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, don't take my money. Yeah. Is a collision detection in phaser uh, bounding box based, or can you do like circular sprites and organic shape collisions? Um, it is bounding box based, but you can tell it that you want it to do full. You can. The game's gonna slow down immediately. Okay. Um, so you like you don't do it with a lot of objects on the screen, um, but you can. You can say, hey, do the real outline, and it'll do the, um, you know, as if it were a, a GIF with a, you know, a clear background. Mm -hmm. It'll it'll slide that way. Okay. It'll do it'll do pixel perfect collision. And is that a, a an entire game mode, or can you just say for this particular sprite? Yeah, you, I believe you can do it on collision. Okay. Um, I haven't used it. Um, but I did look it up because I want. At first, I was like, "Oh, I want the sword to hit, and I want it to be exactly the sword exactly." And then I was like, "Oh, wait, wait, wait! Just the bounding box. What if you have four or five different things you got to animate?" You know, so I'm trying to see if I still have the game server running. Do. Don't let me do a quick example. I'm going to comment this out. I'm going to stay. So here we see, as soon as I change the game, browser file recompiled it. It's in the browser. Um, the only problem, of course, is that I closed the. Can you get that if you start up your game with your front file, right? Is yes. Well, all right. Now we see I can't hit the edges because I commented that out. You can actually pause the game, tap back, wait for my computer to catch up. Sorry, I was piling portlets all day. It's tired. It's breaking. <laughs> And you see, like it, it restarted the game because it reloaded it. Now it's say I hit the edge. You see that I can get hit. And that's the game. You can make whatever changes you want now, sit and play with it. Go, hey, I played with the game, and then I stole the grunt file. It was awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Um, unless anybody has anything, or you guys want to see anybody who wants to see tile, I can do tile. Um, otherwise, I guess at the beginning we are here to line. So if you're here to line, you want to stay in chat. Just question, hang out, do more pizza because they like everyone else wants to pizza. Um, yeah.